Welcome to the Relate Church Podcast. Shockingly, I'm going to ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 5. Right at the beginning, Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. Listen, uh, Brandon just told you that we are in a series called Here As It Is In Heaven. As a church community, that is our vision, that it would be here in us and here in our church and here in this city as it is in heaven because God is here with us. He is changing us. He has called us, and he has put us here for a reason. And so we completely lifted that phrase from Jesus' own words, from his prayer, at the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. And we had planned and do plan on walking together as a church through those three chapters in Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, as they've come to be known. But I cannot move on from the beginning. Part of me really wants to, actually. I would like to just skip ahead and go to the next part, which is full of gold, it's so good. But as you listen to and lean into and allow this word to um, just settle in your heart, and I'm speaking uh, broadly about all of us, but really this is convicting me personally, and so I believe that it's for all of us. Um, my core, like my, my deepest self is comforted and convicted and compelled and confronted by the Beatitudes, by the way that Jesus begins this sermon. And so we are going to linger here for a little bit. And if I can just say for a moment, just um, maybe pastorally, um, as a church community, we very much value different voices. We have an incredible team of teachers. We love to hear from different perspectives, different ages, different um, uh, backgrounds. Uh, it's important to me. I love passing the mic to other people. That, that is part of who we are, that it isn't just one voice, but it is many voices that God speaks to and speaks through. And so I feel quite humbled, honestly, to be up here again. It is me again for however many weeks in a row, and we are here in the same portion of scripture week after week um, because I believe that God is speaking to us and doing something in his church at this moment in time, and he is doing something right here in us, Relate Church, at this moment. And so it is valuable to me, it's important that we just kind of pause and linger here. And so I will share as I believe God is asking me to. Um, not out of a great confidence that this is going to be the best message you've ever heard come out of my mouth. But as I said last week, Marv was teasing me because on Instagram I had put, you know, as a lead up to Sunday, um, it is the greatest message ever preached. Not from me, but it's Jesus' greatest message ever preached. And so, how dare we just motor through. Instead, we are going to slow our roll and allow this to change our hearts. If you're up for it. If you've got the guts, as my nephew Jack said when he was younger. Oswald Chambers refers to these statements of Jesus here in the Beatitudes. We're going to get to them in a moment. He talks about how they are lovely and poetic with the impact of spiritual torpedoes. And that feels accurate to me today. So let me read Matthew chapter 5 verse 1. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. And he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. 
Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Lord, I pray once again, Holy Spirit, that by your presence right here with us, by your leadership in our lives, God, by the miraculous power that is available to us because of Jesus, that you would remove scales from eyes so that we would see you clearly. Lord, would you open ears, deaf ears, to hear the good news, this good news that you pronounced and proclaimed, and that was good news then, and it is such good news for us here today. God, we invite you to convict us, to comfort us, God, to compel us, to draw us nearer in the way that only you can. Have your way here, I ask. Amen. Just a bit of review. We have been here for a few weeks, but I want to remind us all, as we look at, I want to kind of zero in for a few moments together on the very first blessing that Jesus pronounces here. Jesus begins by blessing, by blessing these different groups of people by really congratulating or pointing out the blessing that is theirs because he has come, the kingdom of God has come along with Jesus. And as he is speaking here last week, we talked about how he's essentially giving a tour of the kingdom. He is showing those followers who have come along with him on this mountainside what it looks like when the kingdom of God comes near and how it is displayed in the lives of those who live in his orbit. So imagine that as he is speaking, he's giving a bit of a tour or he's painting a picture of what the kingdom of God looks like. And he is explaining this because the kingdom of God has come as he has come to earth. We know that the kingdom of God has come and the kingdom of God is, is yet coming. But here in this new dimension, as Jesus is introducing it, there is a new language. Blessing is the language of God's kingdom. There is a new culture that he is explaining. He's helping his followers to understand what it looks like in the heavenly realm where he is, which has now overlapped, which is part of the earthly realm where he is living, where he is in relationship with others, where he is communicating. He's explaining how it looks. And as he goes through these, again, I want to just remind us that these are not virtues that are to be lived up to, but instead, these are characteristics of the kingdom that are to be lived into. So we will see these demonstrated in the lives of those who are part of God's kingdom. These ways of living and being, they don't offer salvation. We can get it confused, and I think it is often, and again, just go back and listen or, or, or listen to many different teachings. The Bible Project is walking through this Sermon on the Mount this year. There's lots of incredible information out there, but these, these are not the ways to get to God. This is not how you are saved, by being poor in spirit by being meek. Instead, these are um, what we see in the lives of those who live in this new kingdom that Jesus is introducing. And that matters because it means that we, as Christ followers, we cannot expect those who don't live with Jesus, follow Jesus, who are not in Jesus' orbit to display these characteristics. The world is full of beautiful, incredible, wonderful, servant-hearted people because God has made us all so creatively and wonderfully. But these are not like a moral code that we impose on others, so we get it and you do not. Because unless Jesus is changing and developing and molding your heart, us included, we cannot live these out. It's impossible, it, it will not happen. We can try, we may strive, we may feel guilt and shame when we don't measure up, or, and this is probably more likely, we will be completely repelled, if we're honest, by this list. Because outside of God's kingdom, these aren't beautiful. It doesn't look like a beautiful life. Nobody thinks, yes, I would like 
some of that. It is only beautiful in light of the one who is beautiful, who shows us beauty. And when we first read them, and not just first, you can read them as I have hundreds of times in my life. When we first kind of look at them, they seem to illustrate an upside down life. This is nothing like the culture that we live in. These values don't reflect the life, the world, the neighborhood, the economy that I exist in. It looks like it's upside down, but as we continue to meditate on them and invite God by his spirit to speak to us and change our hearts and change our perspective, we begin to see how the life that we live in is actually the upside down one, and this is right side up. This is how God made us. This is what truly matters. And the way that Jesus begins here, and this is why we're going to just pause today to look at this first blessing or this first beatitude. The way that he begins is really important because it, set, it not only sets the stage, but it is the entrance into all the rest of the beatitudes. Jesus begins, and this is shocking and life-altering if we allow it to be, by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Eugene Peterson said it this way, you're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. There is a blessing, guys, at the end of yourself. Even as I say those words, I know that for some of you that hits as a blessing because you're there today at the end of yourself. And you receive that blessing of Jesus. And for others, or maybe you feel both things at the same time, that's very possible, to hear that the blessing that Jesus is pronouncing is when we come to the end of ourselves or feel like we're at the end of our ropes, that isn't um, enticing because we want nothing to do with that. We would prefer to have control and a plan and know that we can make things happen in our own strength. I don't know if you have heard of um, the art of Swedish death cleaning. Anyone? Is this a familiar term? Swedish death cleaning. I know it sounds morbid, and it is inherently because it's in the title. So forgive me, but I think this is valuable. Um, there was a book that was written in recent years that is called The Gentle Arts of Swedish Death Cleaning. And what it basically is is a way when you come to the end of your life or maybe you're thinking about the end of your life. Sometimes it is prompted by losing somebody else and, and watching, and if, if you've ever experienced a death in your close family, you know what this feels like. When somebody is suddenly gone but all that belongs to them remains. And then there's the painful work of sorting through that and taking care of just the earthly things that are left over. And so there is this method um, that apparently the Swedish own, I don't know, of course it's the Swedes, but of looking through your things before that time comes and kind of adopting a labeling system and, and going through it so that there is less of your um, belongings when the time comes so that others have less of a burden, I guess, in going through it. And I bring that up because uh, we've talked about it recently. My mom a few years ago, not that sh she is going anywhere <laughs> in the near future, hopefully, um, but went through all of your stuff and just got rid of it. And my, stuff. And my dad's stuff. <laughs> <that you're not laughs> <doing that. laughs> they would... Yes, I could go off on that for a bit. Very different perspectives. We were talking in our, um, was it in our community where we were talking through this? Yes, about how there's always different. There's always one in a family who likes things and there is always one who wants to get rid of all the things. And God made us so uniquely so that he put us together to figure that out together. Anyhow, I have been thinking about the work of the Holy Spirit and how he works in our lives. And we know that Holy Spirit is the God that is within us and the God that is with us. God who counsels us, who advocates for us, 
the God who gives us wisdom, the God who gently leads us and, and changes us. And I wonder if part of what the Holy Spirit does in our lives as Jesus followers is this gentle process of pointing out that which is essential, which we must hold on to. This cannot go. And at the same time, pointing out or sticking, you know, a red label on a few things that are essentials and then a blue sticker on those things that we could release in order to take hold of that which is truly life. And in, the reason I, I bring this up is because I have recognized in my own life, and guys, this was not in the distant past. This has been in just this, this week. How God so kindly and gently takes me by the hand. And when I can handle it and wrap my head around it, he points out things in my life that I have held on to because they provide a measure of safety or comfort. Even as I will preach and long for and hope for God to do something new, to change his church, to change our vision, to, to develop what he is doing in this day, which I believe will look different. It does look different today than it did 10 years ago. Not that that was bad, but he is always doing a new thing and leading us in a new way. I long for that part of me, and then part of me wants to go back to what is safe and how I, I know to plan, to do, to make things happen. Not necessarily in my own strength, but with a whole lot of my own strength. And he consistently kind of leads me and removes that which I would cling to and points out what I might want to let go of, repent of. We talked about Jesus' message was a message of repentance. Turn, change your mind. You're going in the wrong direction. Come and follow me. Yeah. And so Holy Spirit comes alongside us as we allow him to and give him permission to. And he doesn't condemn us. There is no shame. So when, the, when we feel like condemnation, shame, like we are overcome with what needs to change, that isn't how God works. Instead, it might feel like garbage because none of us embrace change. But he will gently lead us and convict us and allow us to let go of those things that are not serving us in our pursuit of God. Jesus begins with, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. That poor in spirit, being a picture of open hands, empty hands, being needy, needful of God's spirit. Poor in spirit are those who recognize their need for God. And so when we find ourselves at the end of ourselves, there is a blessing there because we can no longer power through on our own. We can't figure it out yeah. with our own intellect. That all is God-given and it helps us in the journey, but there is a blessing in recognizing that apart from God working in my life, I have very little to offer. However, that is not the case. He is in yeah. my life, he yeah. is working, he is changing me and he is changing us. And so this is good news, a message of hope. And if you listen and forgive me, I know I'm gonna offend everybody today. And please, I'm smiling nicely, so just go along with me. Um, if you feel a, a desire uh, to like skip past this and not talk about it, or maybe just zone out for a moment until we get to like more hopeful stuff, I want to tell you that I do too. I feel that too. Me too. Um, part of me doesn't even want to teach this because I know that in teaching it, I cannot teach it unless I live it and embrace it for myself. And so there's always part of us that wants to resist that. However, if there is part of you that, that yearns for, that leans into, that wants what you cannot produce yourself, if there is even a tiny bit of hunger or thirst in you for the things of God, if you are compelled to lean in toward him, that is the work of his spirit working in us. It is God's spirit that draws us to Jesus, and this is good news. So my prayer is that all of us collectively would see the beauty that is here 
would, would be compelled by who Jesus is, would have a fresh revelation of how good and magnificent and transcendent and beautiful he is, and see that the life he offers us here, it is, it is truly life. This is the good life. Chuck Swindle, um, speaking on the Sermon on the Mount, he wrote this, most sermons are more negative than positive, more like scathing rebukes than affirmation, not this one. With beautiful simplicity using terms any age could understand, Jesus brought blessing rather than condemnation. Having endured a lifetime of verbal assaults by the scribes and the Pharisees, the multitude on the mount must have thought they had died and gone to heaven. It is good, good, good news. The kingdom has come. Jesus talked about how the kingdom of God had come as he demonstrated his power and authority. He announced the kingdom as he cast out demons. And he, he sent his disciples out in the same way to go and spread the good news around. Luke chapter 9 at the beginning says, Jesus had called the twelve together. And then he gave them power and authority to drive out demons and cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Paul confirms that this is where we live today as Jesus' followers. Colossians chapter 1. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. In Philippians, he writes, our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. God's kingdom has come, and it is yet to come. And this first blessing, blessing the poor in spirit, it comes first and it precedes the rest because it is a necessity, as I said, it's fundamental. There is no one who experiences God's kingdom who isn't aware of their need for God or their poverty in spirit. Those of you who are here today, I am confident, unless you were raised in church and you have come along and been taught over many years, you didn't find yourself crying out to God or in church because you were winning at life. How many of you would say that, yes, when I had finally figured everything out and I was, everything was good, my relationships were awesome, I was making enough money, I had dreams and visions, life was amazing, the Canadian dream, I decided, you know what, let's go to church, let's try that too. Anyone? <laughs> Maybe, but I doubt, I doubt that's very common. We know that what happens so often, this is how God works, is that when we come to the end of our rope, we come to the end of ourself. When we find that the answers that once worked for us no longer give hope, that they are empty. When the promises of the culture around us suddenly prove to be full of lies. When we are looking for a hope outside of what we have been sold, we tend to look heavenward. We call out to God. And he meets us in that place. That is the best part. It brings us so much joy over and over again to see how God meets with people who are desperate, hungry yeah. for him. Yeah. To celebrate the baptisms last <coughs> week of lives that have been transformed by Jesus. It is the work that God does in the lives of his people. He does this. He brings a blessing in that place of need. And this is how he works. There must always be an emptying before there is a filling. In order to pour out new wine, the old wine must be emptied from the wineskin. There is always a conviction before there is a conversion. There's always a recognition of my need before I look for it to be filled. This is why, especially in the Canadian church, I believe, there has been a long season of people not being particularly interested because life is okay. It's okay, it's not great, but it's okay. Our needs are mostly met until they're not. Until they're not, until we come to that end. 
But God does this, and he does it in the lives of his people over and over again. Isaiah 57. This is what the high and exalted one says. He who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but also with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Again, in the message, I don't have this on the screens, this has just been preaching to me. (coughs) A message from the high and towering God, who lives in eternity, whose name is holy. Yeah, I don't. I live in the high and holy places, but also with the low-spirited, the spirit crushed. And what I do is put new spirit in them, get them up and on their feet again. As you look through scripture, we see over and over again, God at work in the lives of those who are poor in spirit. We'll often say, God is so amazing in how he always chooses the ones that we would not choose to do the work that he needs to be done. Over and over again, we think of somebody like Moses. Exodus chapter three, as Moses encounters God in the burning bush, he says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? David writes in Psalm 8, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind, all of us, that you are mindful of them? Human beings, that you care for them. Isaiah has a vision of God in all his glory, and this is how he responds. He says, woe to me, I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. I think of Gideon, who is overwhelmed. Many people throughout Scripture. And in case you might think, well, that is just the the personalities who are kind of small, meek, mild. I will remind you that there is also Peter, the man who was aggressive. He had an anger problem. He, he had a confidence. He didn't hold back. He was, uh, you could, some might label him as like cocky. He was impulsive. Um, but when he truly sees Jesus, uh, Jesus had helped him and the others catch a miraculous, um, catch a fish. And here is what Simon Peter says. He falls at Jesus' knees and he says, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Or Paul, who many people have an issue with Paul because he too, he's, he's, he's confident. He has to be careful not to brag, even as it seems like he's kind of bragging in, in some scriptures. But he's intentional to not boast because he, he knows that he has a pedigree, that he has intellect, that he has an ability. And yet, he writes that he comes in weakness with great fear and trembling. And it's not a demonstration of their insecurity. But instead, it is the only right response when you see God, when you encounter the presence of God. Jesus told a story in Luke 18, and I'm just going to read this out of the voice because it's fun that way. Jesus says this. Imagine two men walking up a road, going to the temple to pray. One of them is a Pharisee, and the other is a despised tax collector. Once inside the temple, the Pharisee stands up and prays this prayer in honor of himself. God, how I thank you that I am not on the same level as the other people. Crooks, cheaters, sexually immoral, like this tax collector over there. Just look at me. I fast not once but twice a week, and I faithfully pay my tithes on every penny of income. Over in the counter, over in the corner, not in the counter, the tax collector begins to pray, but he won't lift his eyes to heaven. He pounds on his chest in sorrow and says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now imagine these two men walking back down the road to their homes. This is still Jesus speaking. Jesus says, listen, it's the tax collector who walks home clean before God and not the Pharisee because whoever lifts himself up will be put down and whoever takes a humble place will be lifted up. 
And the point isn't that we hide in a corner and pound our chest in sorrow. But the point is that we are encouraged as he shares this story that in the presence of God, as we come to the altar, as we raise our hands to worship, as we do the things that are the practices of the kingdom of God, we should be, and God would desire that our hearts would be moved by how great he is. That in light of how good he is, we would be humbled. Our perspective on our power, our ability, our strength, our smarts would come into alignment with how powerful and capable he is. Max Licato wrote it this way. He wrote a book uh, based on the Sermon on the Mount called The Applause of Heaven. You don't impress the officials of NASA with a paper airplane. You don't boast about your crayon sketches in the presence of Picasso. You don't claim equality with Einstein because you can write H2O. And you don't boast about your goodness in the presence of the perfect. So in light of all of this, coming to the end of ourselves, it is a blessing. It is a blessing. There is a blessing right there when you find yourself in that place. And we don't produce this in our lives. We don't go looking to, to create this. We find ourselves there, and there Jesus calls us blessed. At the end of your physical strength, some of you are strong. You require very little sleep, perhaps. You can get stuff done. You have been graced with strength. At the end of your physical strength, he is there. At the end of your bravery, at the end of your efforts, he is there. At the end of your certainty, maybe you are in a season of reevaluating all that you have held closely and held dear. And you've been certain about a few things that you are no longer sure of any longer. I pray that you would find him right there. Perhaps not who you thought him to be, not what was passed on to you, but Jesus himself there. That's my prayer for us, that we would find him there. How do you embrace all of this, well, I don't know, I'm still working this out in real time, but I know this, that we receive him, that there is no grasping in God's kingdom. We don't make it happen, we receive the kingdom. We'll talk more about that later as we continue. But Jesus said that the kingdom of God belongs to little children, and that, we know that, and we love it. But it isn't because little children are so innocent. Instead, it's because they are completely incapable. Wow. Yeah. All they can do is receive. Yeah. And so the kingdom is theirs. Those of you who are in the 12-step community, you know that it is when you come to the end of yourself, when we declare that I am unable to help myself, it is there that we find that there is a path to freedom. I know that walking alongside those who, who have struggled with addiction, and I'm not just speaking of others, we all deal with addiction in different ways in our own lives, but you find yourself when it's somebody who you love deeply who is struggling, praying that this would be a bottom. Have we found the bottom here yet so that now we can change? There is a blessing there at the bottom because we come to the end of ourselves. And so today I pray that we would receive his kingdom. This is good news for all of us. And what we could also do, and this is what I am practicing myself, and I would invite all of us to do as well today, 
is to turn this blessing of Jesus, this beatitude, into a prayer. To pray, God, show me where I have been, where I am self-sufficient, where I am competent, where I am making things happen outside of obeying you, outside of your provision, your calling, your empowering. I don't want it outside of what he is calling me and calling us to do. And so we can take that blessing. He calls us blessed right here. And we can turn it into a prayer. And that is what I'd like to invite us to do right here. Actually, team, you can come and join me. I'd be so thankful. To just pause. And ask God. And maybe I will do just that here today. If you want to close your eyes for a moment, I would invite you to. And God, in this moment of reflection, invitation, we receive the blessing that you've pronounced. We receive your blessing today, Lord. You call us blessed. Thank you. And so, Lord, I ask, would you show each one of us where have we, where are we powering through, grasping, clinging, and you would invite us to let go, to trust, to be carried, to be comforted, to be led. God, would you show us your strength where we are truly weak? God, would you show us your beauty? Show us your beauty. We repent where we've been distracted, striving, anxious, overwhelmed. God, where we've been stressing and ruminating. God, we, we repent, we turn, and we set our eyes on you instead. I'm just going to let this sit for a moment that God speaks with us right here as you invite him to. offer you 
our lives and our plans, our calendar. Give you permission. Search our hearts, Lord. And God, well, we may feel convicted to empty ourselves. Lord, it is not to be empty. But I pray that you would fill us with your spirit. God of abundance. God of all glory. Creator of heaven and earth. The God of eternity. You live outside of time. So help us to see from your perspective here, Lord. God, even as I feel the heaviness, the weight of decisions that you are leading us into, God, I pray that you would anoint us with joy, the oil of joy for mourning. God, that you would stir within us a vision bigger than our small and finite needs. God, you're bigger, you are greater. God, I pray that you will be close to the brokenhearted. Lord, I pray for those who are hard-hearted today, where we've walled ourselves off to protect that which is vulnerable. God, I pray that you would come close. You promised to give your people a soft heart. So we surrender to your care. Lord, as we remember this morning the words of Jesus and the life that he lived, ultimately we celebrate today because out of love you went to the cross, Jesus. Out of love for each one of us, seeing us in our situation, seeing the whole of our lives, you died. You paid the price for our shortcoming, for our sin, for our failure. And you offered us freedom, the fullness of life. And so we receive today the healing and shalom that comes from you. It doesn't exist outside of you. But here, God, we find it in you. As we receive communion this morning and we take that bread Lord, we thank you for your body broken for us. And we drink that juice and we thank you for your blood poured out for us. Forgiving us, washing us, cleansing us, giving us a future, a hope. God, as we go to the cross today, we find forgiveness in you. And God, I pray that you would strengthen us to forgive those have trespassed against us. We can't do it outside of your strength, God. We are inept, incapable, but you empower your people with strength. God, would you strengthen us today with that supernatural power? And God, again on a Sunday morning, I thank you for your blessing in our lives. It's ours, and God, May we walk in a way where we become a blessing, where we bless and not curse. God, where we demonstrate what love looks like because you've loved us so well. We receive that today. We thank you. We're so grateful. Come, Holy Spirit, I ask. Amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. If something stood out to you, if you'd like to submit a prayer request, or if you'd like to learn more about how you can get connected, email relate at relatechurch.ca. If you'd like to partner with us and our community initiatives, please visit relatechurch.ca slash give. It's been an honor to spend this time with you. Catch you next week.